Um, just thrilled you all are here, but above all, thrilled that you are here, Constance Mountainson. Um, before we get started, I'm actually going to transition after introducing Brian Dang, our new programming coordinator here for all things public programs at MOCA. Um, this is the baton passing you're all witness to. So without further ado, Brian will introduce tonight's program. And again, thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you all for coming. As Amanda mentioned, I'm Brian Ding, the programming coordinator here at MOCA. Uh, we're very happy to have Constance Mallinson and Rebecca Lowry here with us this evening um, to discuss Constance's work in and in relation to our current exhibition, With Pleasure, Pattern and Decoration in American Art, 1972 to 1985. Uh, this program is part of a series of discussions with artists in, in the exhibition to further draw on the stories and parts of art history that are continued to be explored. Um, Constance Mallinson has exhibited widely throughout California and has lived and worked here for many years. Some of her most recent solo exhibitions include project series at Pomona College and Matters of Decay at UC Riverside. Her most, uh, most recently, she curated the feminine sublime at pa Pasadena Museum of Art. Constance has widely taught at major universities, including UCLA, Art Center, and Otis. And she has written for publications such as Art in America and Extra. Um, Rebecca Lowry is our assistant curator who worked closely and extensively with our curator, Anna Katz, on the Pattern and Decoration ex exhibition. She is also the steward of our permanent collection. And her past shows include, at MOCA include the foundation of the museum with senior curator Bennett Simpson and the forthcoming Gerhard Richter retrospective. So please join me in welcoming Constance and Rebecca. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm excited for us to dig in, and I think that Constance would like to say a few words to begin with. I am. Oh, I thought we'd have. <laughs> <laughs> if not, we can start with questions. Oh, okay. But we well, wanted to set the scene, maybe. We wanted to set yes, the thing. Yes, right. Okay. Um, 1970s. I wasn't sure at what point we were going to set the yeah. thing. But, Let's um, start it. I want everybody to go back to 1970. And just to set the stage for uh, what artists were thinking about, uh, being told, being exposed to what the dialogues were at that point. And um, so in 1970, when I graduated from school, uh, Clement Greenberg was the, the critic. And uh, in those days, they actually had critics who meant something. <laughs> <laughs> who had authority. And so I thought just to, to set the tone for how some of this work came about, I'd read a few quotes from uh, Greenberg and also his acolyte, Ad Reinhardt. Um, just stop me if it gets to be uh, too much. Uh, the first important item on the avant-garde's agenda is an escape from ideas which were infecting the arts with the ideological struggles of society. This meant a new and greater emphasis on form. Purity in, in art consists in the acceptance, willing acceptance, of the limitations of the medium of the specific art. The purely plastic or abstract qualities of the work of art are the only ones that count. The pristine flatness of the stretch canvas constantly struggles to overcome every other element. Purity means self-definition, the stressing of the flatness of the surface, which is more fundamental than anything else. The essential norms or conventions of painting are the limiting conditions with, with, with which a picture must comply in order to be experienced as a picture. Certain refusals or abstinences seem to be necessary simply because the way to stronger, more expressive art lies through them. 
I regard flatness and the enclosing of flatness not just as the limiting condition of pictorial art, but as criteria of aesthetic quality. The further a work advances self-definition of an art, the better that work of art is bound to be. So he had a very definite influence on uh, painters at the time, and so I wanted to read some of Ad Reinhardt's further um, embellishments of Greenberg. And he was a very reductive painter and also uh, quite in the, um, the limelight at that point. The one thing to say about art is that it is one thing. Art preoccupied with its own process and means, with its own identity and distinction, art needs no justification with any ideas. Any combining, mixing, adding, exploiting, diluting, vulgarizing, or popularizing abstract art deprives art of its essence and depraves the artist's artistic consciousness. The one warrant for a fine artist, the one painting, is the painting of the one size canvas. The single scheme, one formal device, one color monochrome, one linear division in each direction, one symmetry, one texture, one indivisibility, no lines or imaginings, no shapes or composing or representings, no visions or sensations, <clears throat> no symbols or signs, <clears throat> no decoratings or colorings or picturings, no pleasures, no things, no ideas, no relations, contentless, formlessness, timelessness. My paintings are the last paintings one can make. And he came up with the 12 rules for painting. No texture, no brushwork, no sketching or drawing, no forms, no design, no colors, no light, no space, no subject, no symbols, signs, or meanings, with no pleasure or pain. The busier the work of art, the worse it is. And so thank you, Clement and, and Ad, for telling me how to paint. I just wouldn't have known. It was all those things. So, uh, so that was the climate in 1970. My goodness. That's a lot of rules. And it's a lot of rules. It's a lot of rules. And I would add a couple of other rules from the time um, just to bring us further into 1970, rules for women, um, because this exhibition and Constance's work at the time had a lot to do with the feminist art movement. So in 1970, a woman can't take out a loan without a male co-signer. Roe v. Wade hasn't been uh, decided yet. Uh, one can still be fired from a job for being pregnant. That's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg, really. We couldn't wear pants on campus, and we had an 11 o'clock curfew, mm -hmm. and the men had no curfew. Right. <laughs> Pure. Lots of rules. Lots yeah, of lots rules. of rules about purity in both cases, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about you in 1970, receiving your BFA from the University of Georgia. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you grew up in Washington, D.C., uh, what brought you down to Georgia, and what was graduate school like, art school, in the late 60s? Was it like what you just described? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to even think about the P&D show without thinking of the 60s. Um, now, there was, the reason I chose Georgia was that my parents, who were paying for school, had... Um, put their finger down on just about everything else. Maybe they must have heard about the no pants on campus or something, but um, just to tell you what I was uh, coming from in high school, I had gone to an all-girls religious school, and uh, you talk about rules. Um, I remember we had to uh, frequently, when, when someone was looking at our skirt and they thought it was too short, we had to kneel in front of that teacher, and if our skirt didn't touch the floor, we were sent home. So you can imagine when I heard that um, Georgia was a party school, I said, you know, I think I might give that a shot. <laughs> it had an okay art department. It was all male, completely. Um, the art history text, I was just thinking of this a little while ago, uh, it was 
Arneson and uh, Jansen. That Jansen was the text for art history. I don't think there was a single female artist in the entire book. I'm sure there wasn't because it's been not, revised. Yeah, of it's been, but you know, it's been a slow process because when I first was in college studying art history, it was the late '90s, and we were looking at new the newest editions of Jansen, where they tried to shoehorn some artists <laughs> in. So Miriam Shapiro, <laughs> maybe than never, that's right. Miriam Shapiro was in there. Maybe there was an Alice Neal, and I think they got Artemisia Gentileschi back in the day. Yeah. But they they really hadn't added yeah. very many. So yeah. there, uh, you know, there wasn't uh, a lot out there to work with. Um, now the artists in modern art, um, he sneaked in. Um, Louise Nevelson and Helen Frankenthal. I think there were a couple. So things were, you know, by, <laughs> they were kind of moving along. But, um, you know, the 60s, uh, of course, if you weren't there, <laughs> it's hard to describe. But, uh, you know, it was definitely a time of great rebellion and um, revolution in the air. So we were, we were really primed to... Uh, to rebel and um, you know uh, participate in all the new freedoms, and uh, I know you had asked um, what uh, what the training, our mm -hmm. training was like. Right. And I have to say there really wasn't any. There was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of <laughs> a lot of sexual promiscuity. Um, few nude art parties, mm -hmm. and it, you know, it was a wild time. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we took our cues from that, right. and um, you know, okay. history. So then you moved back to Washington, D.C., and uh, started making art on your own. Mm -hmm. What did your art look like at the time? Well, I did embrace the minimalist aesthetic, although in school I was a little more drawn to the pop artists. Uh, now that oddly enough, has not come up much either in the catalog or in our discussions. Right, pop predecessors. I mean, it was, yeah. uh, pop was kind of in between abex and minimalism. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know why it, it wasn't brought into the discussion, but it was very a very critical period um, just in terms of... Um, breaking down the, the barriers between high art, low art, mm -hmm. uh, allowing things like mass culture to enter into the dialogue. So uh, would P&D have happened without pop? I'm not sure. I, I mean, think I that's think a great question. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, Warhol was, was, uh, was really out there. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think... Uh, you know, even somebody even said that his uh, serial images, remember the cows and the, you know, sure, the electric of chairs and all that stuff, in some way uh, predated some of the patterning in patterning decoration. So, sure. uh, so it was it was really uh, as influential. Then I sort of took a turn and um, thought I'd uh, make my best shot at entering into the uh, contemporary dialogue by uh, trying out minimalism. So uh, I worked in a kind of reductive fashion for a year or two and actually got quite a bit of notice because of that. And that makes sense because, you know, if, uh, if the Greenbergian rules were, were uh, in place, dominating, then it would make sense that, uh, I remember um, a curator from the National Gallery had seen my work and um, he put me in a show and then things seemed to really happen at that point. So anyway, that, that was, uh, so was very early. And this era in Washington is uh, full of work that Greenberg would have called post-painterly abstraction, right? The Kenneth Nolans and the Morris Lewis and the Sam Gilliams and... It was called the Washington the Color School. Yes, the ones and who were based all in D.C. three, I think, yeah. in the school, <laughs> but... <laughs> but, uh, you know, they had to work with what they had. And uh, the 
the audience for contemporary art in Washington was extremely limited. Somebody pulled me aside at that point and said, um, people in Washington like antiques. They don't like contemporary painting. <laughs> and so think of all those Georgetown houses. Oh, yeah, and, as a and, fellow D.C. native. Okay, right? <laughs> so, so that was kind of the scene. And um, nevertheless, I had a little studio, um, and a kind of Georgetown adjacent building, and um, worked consistently there, and um, knew I wasn't going to get into the Washington Collar School. But we had great museums. Mm -hmm. We had... Um, the Mellon Collection, National Gallery, we had the Phillips Collection, we had the Corcoran. And of course, you know, the Corcoran was the site of the infamous Maplethorpe show a uh, decade later. Oh, but, yeah, absolutely. Uh, anyway, yeah. so um, a lot of changes in the air. And, uh, so changes in the air culturally, too, and you made a big move cross country. Right, directly to LA, do not pass New York, do not <laughs> pass Chicago. <laughs> uh, so you went all the way across the country. Um, what did you find when you got here? When did you move to LA? Uh, 1978, mm -hmm. um, major culture shock. Uh, my spouse was telling me, it, we were reminiscing about it on the car drive, the two hour car drive down here tonight. <laughs> and so uh, he had come to, uh, find us a place to live, and uh, <laughs> checked into the Saharan Motel in Hollywood, thinking, okay. The one okay, that's still there? It's still there. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there was like the hookers and the, um, anyway, so <laughs> while he was uh, searching for our first place to live, he said, we had lived in a um, 18th century house in, um, in the D.C. area, and um, kind of snobby about the whole, you know, and so uh, Eric says, uh, can someone tell me where the old section of town is? <laughs> this was at the Saharan Motel. And so I, I don't know who it was that, honey, you're in it. <laughs> so that was our cult initial culture shock. <laughs> we're in the 18th century house. So um, anyway, um, and I found uh, it was actually a Sandals year round, which was great because I love wearing sandals. Anyway, uh, a lot of a lot to get used to mm -hmm. freeway. It took me a year before I realized when the freeway sign said said Topanga C Y N. Uh -huh. I thought it was Topanga Sin. Yeah. I said, is that old Welsh or something? <laughs> so yeah, t it took me a while. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we uh, we settled. Right, and, uh, and then in terms of the art worlds, what was going on here in the late 70s? Well, it was a lot bigger than Washington, um, but there was no MoCA. LACMA was, uh, I think the, the old LACMA, the Pereira building was up. Yeah, anyway. Um, there were a few galleries on La Cienega. Um, it was still a small scene. There was a Venice scene, which was very male-centric. Right. Uh, I noticed Billy Al is in this show. Yes. Um, there were a handful of uh, male artists who dominated, Laddie Dill, Chuck Arnaldi, um, uh, Billy Al. And then there was the whole sort of King Holtz uh, scene mm -hmm. as well. There was the assemblage scene. So the, it was... It was Diverse. Yeah. It was diverse. Um, they didn't listen to Clement's rules, obviously. So right, I, right. Uh, um, but still, you know, not many women showing. Yeah. Uh, and for an outsider as my, such as myself, who really didn't know anyone, uh, it was kind of formidable, mm -hmm. thinking, you know, how am I going to get into this and right. find, my, find my way? So, uh, yeah. But by 1980, as you can see on the screen, and this is one of uh, Constance's drawings in the exhibition, you had broken through to a new mode of working, right? And that had to do with a number of factors. Can you talk about how you came to this from the more minimalist? Well, I, I did manage to get a studio um, within that those couple of years and um, started meeting. I got my studio downtown. And um, 
found a really wonderful community. I see Pauline sitting out here tonight. She was part of that. Uh, Marion Essence is in the show. Um, we shared the same loft building. So uh, Was that downtown? That was downtown. So um, it started really opening up for me at that point. Uh, she had been pretty involved in the feminist art movement. It was prior to the time I'd been there. So, uh, and so it was a great introduction and a, and a great community to start up with. Mm -hmm. And um, so, of course, I was um, avidly following uh, the writings of uh, women artists at that point. Um, there were, you know, Joyce Kozloff, who's also in the show, um, was uh, writing actively, and most of that was out of New York, but uh, that didn't mean we didn't, we weren't influenced by it, so. Um, was that things like Heresies? There was a feminist heresies, art journal. Yeah, yeah. all mm -hmm. of that. Um, so that, that was, uh, drove a lot of our ideas, and um, so, um, Within those writings, there was, in fact, uh, I was, uh, I think I brought a little bit of what Joyce had written in response to Ad Reinhardt's, <laughs> and it's, it's actually up on the wall. Yeah, the we text. have it blown yeah. up in the exhibition. But just yeah. to, uh, an answer to Ad Reinhardt's on negation, <laughs> um, and just a few of the words I pulled out, anti-pure, anti-purist, anti-puritanical, anti-reductivist, anti-cold, anti-controlled, anti-elitist, anti-heroic, anti-genius, anti-master, and on affirmation, additive, subjective, eccentric, gestural, colorful, handmade, warm, open, questioning, sharing, rococo, funny, narrative. Those were just some of the... Uh, so this was tremendously liberating mm -hmm. um, to think that uh, our stories were important, our, uh, our uh, processes were important, and um, uh, so it was um, kind of a confluence of many things for me, mm -hmm. uh, finding a community of artists, um, and then um, sort of being exposed to these kinds of ideas were, gave me the courage, I guess, to try some of these uh, these ideas. Right, so. right, and and Joyce Kozloff is writing this statement at the kind of early outset of the pattern yeah, integration. Yeah, that was 75. 70, 76, I'm yeah. sorry, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just really when it's gaining some steam. The first PND exhibition has taken place already in New York at the Alessandra Gallery, and there's a PS1 show coming up the following year, right? So things are hotting up with the movement quite a bit. But that is in terms of the um, public perception of the movement, right? For years and years already, artists, uh, Miriam Shapiro, Joyce Kozlov, you and Marian Estes here in LA have been talking and working in this mode, right? And it takes a minute for curators and the public to start to recognize what this new work is and that there is a trend underway. What did it mean for you? What did pattern, did you use the term pattern and decoration at the time, as a first question. Mm, I don't recall. Uh, <laughs> deferring to my spouse again, he said, I know what S and M is, but I don't know what P and D is. <laughs> <laughs> so that, <laughs> so <laughs> that gives you an idea about yeah, yeah. how widespread the dialogue right. was. Well, you know, that, that's a Thank term. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> it's a term that somebody came up with along the way. So how did you describe or think about what you were doing in work like this? Uh, well, we, um, we didn't... Um, uh, there were few shows out here that embraced this work. I remember the Arco Center for the Arts. Right. Uh, had an exhibition, uh, and they did title it, I believe, something pattern. Mm -hmm. So it was being um, seen in those terms. Um, 
we had Christopher Knight, who was an early champion. Mm -hmm. um, so he was beginning to lay out the terms for it and champion, championing it. Right. Uh, so that was all important. Uh, we didn't have the same kind of numbers here in LA of people, of painters who were practitioners of that. Um, so, um, you know, it, it did feel like a bit of a, a, an outpost at first. And, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's also there's that, that uh, I kind of went back to that Bob Dylan line that, uh, um, you know, it's about sort of, I think he was talking about the 60s, but I think it's applicable here to uh, um, the... Uh, the way we saw what we were doing, and that is, uh, um, oh, where is it? I should get, be able to remember it. Um, okay. Uh, well, anyway, it was something like uh, we didn't we didn't really know what we were doing at the time, but we did it anyway. Yeah. So something like that. Yeah. yeah. Who uh, does? And, um, but it. Uh, it felt right, mm -hmm. um, you know. It felt uh, uh, as if we were tapping into something much bigger than we were, um, and I think that uh, pattern and decoration, all the uh, sort of emphasis on uh, accepting work outside of the uh, canon, the modernist canon, challenging the canon. Um, challenging the tyranny of Greenberg and Ed Reinhardt and these male painters who dominated, uh, that felt pretty big. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, we were tapping into something. Something huge, right? But you were tapping into it. Here's a detail from the same drawing with some very tightly controlled intimate, and refined, intimate, intimate yeah. gestures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, you made your own rules. So can you describe the drawings and paintings you were making at this period in terms of process? Well, um, you know, any painter is gonna be involved with a process, of course. Um, and I think I explained to you that uh, you do a lot of trial and error, you know. Um, and the first paintings and drawings I did with the individual layered strokes, um, I ended up tossing out, you know, they just didn't quite make it. But I did arrive at the scale, which was almost the same scale as a woven carpet or a woven uh, tapestry, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so the. There, there's kind of a mixture in the work at, from a sort of Zen meditative approach, mm -hmm. which is losing oneself in the process, um, and the the idea that uh, you can discover yourself through this meditative, repetitious, ritualistic process. Mm -hmm. That had a lot of appeal to me. Conversely, um, the, the feminist side of that says this is an assertion of the body. This is uh, something that says it's undeniably made with a, a body and a person doing this day after day after day. So I don't know whether those two things were at odds with one another, but mm -hmm. they did kind of uh, come together for me in an important way that... Uh, uh, there was kind of almost a spiritual devotion going here. Right. And um, then this reference to repetitive uh, women's work, like mm -hmm. weaving and um, embroidery, that type of thing. Right. So, um, um, so basically, uh, to make... Now, these are just the drawings. Mm -hmm. The paintings were made in the same way. They were scaled up. So... Um, the paintings typically were eight, nine feet tall, mm -hmm. wide. And uh, so there's, there was this kind of field of marks where you were just sort of absorbed into them. Um, and what I would do would be to set down a, a grid, a t uh, like a quarter-inch grid, and I'd start 
layering in the strokes one by one, one on top of the other. And the paintings took up to six months to make. The drawings I could probably get out in a month or so. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was the, and then, so I laid down stroke after stroke of color, and then the final layer would be this pattern. So, mm -hmm. um, and the patterns were uh, derived from a number of different sources, but I was looking at um, just sort of traditional herring bones, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, also, was really interested in Chinese lattice patterns because they were all about these interlocking mm -hmm. shapes. And um, so, yes, this there's one. one. Yeah. So, um, I mean, if you think of the swastika, it was a Chinese lattice pattern where they oh, interesting. repeated it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's opposite direction from the Nazi swastika. Yeah. But anyway, that's a very ancient uh, mm -hmm. pattern, Chinese pattern. So, um, so these repeats of these uh, interlocking shapes. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's mesmerizing to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's very centering, too. And so I think, um, you know, all of those kind of came together for me in terms of centering me here in LA in this giant place. And I could focus on this mm -hmm. and um, sort of create this record of this doing and this this process, so mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And when you approach these drawings and your paintings, there were a number of your paintings from this period recently on view at Edward Sella in Culver City, right? Did, did there were a number of the the paintings from this same era recently oh, on Cella, view yeah. in Cella, uh -huh. sorry, um, right. in mm -hmm. uh, in Culver City, which mm -hmm. is great because they have a, obviously a different kind of materiality as paint versus um, colored pencil. Um, but that labor becomes very evident and almost overwhelming when you start to consider them, right? There was a critic in the writing in the LA Times on the occasion of your first solo show here who said something like, Hmm. Glad you oh. have it written down. Yeah, do you have this? Yeah. No, well, he, he said it was Robert Pincus, and he said that... Oh, Robert Pincus, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. looking, looking deeply at them, one can almost forget the presence of an individual artist. So to mm -hmm. your point about that kind of anonymity. But the labor itself it comes out as the assertive statement, and the labor itself is the aesthetic. I, I think that's true. I think there was a whole... Uh, I'm going to do this at such a scale and at such a um, intensity that is impossible to deny. Yeah. So you know, so there's a couple different, sometimes paradoxical threads running through it. You know, the the Zen part mm -hmm. where you lose oneself, and the viewer can get lost in it as well. You know, lost in the sea of mark making, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, in in contrast to that I, is a kind of you will recognize me because I've done so much of this. Right. You, know, you you can't deny this. Mm -hmm. So um, right, right. So I think that was uh, sort of interesting to me that mm -hmm. it could operate on a number of different levels. So well, yeah, and in in making that kind of assertion, right? You're making visible and working with the idea of the woven form, right? There's a way in which it makes visible, these drawings make visible, the countless anonymous laboring hours of anonymous craftspeople of women throughout the ages, right? The, the weaving, the housework, the constant, right, attention mm -hmm. to um, the domestic and to the decorative and the beautification, right, that goes unheralded and somehow in um, recapitulating that labor in a different format, mm -hmm. it is made visible. Well said. And, and of course, you think at also at the time, non-painters like uh, Mary Kelly were doing her postpartum project, which was documenting every step of the birth and raising of her child. And uh, so there was a, a confluence of these ideas, both conceptually and in the visual arts. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, 
because you're, you're acknowledging these anonymous artists of the past, the mm -hmm. weavers, the, the, uh, the um, uh, basket makers, mm -hmm. all of these. Um, and yet, we didn't want to be anonymous. Of course not. <laughs> So you know, there's there's a uh, there's there's a an oddity to it all because we're saying, well, you know, we're we're uh, acknowledging that past that that um, dismissal this, or dismissiveness of mm -hmm. women's work, but now we're doing it in a sphere where it has to be considered and has to be taken taken seriously. Oh yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. And so in context, oh, I was going to show another slide of the uh, Are we all installation. All the way up to the present now? Well, we're <laughs> almost there. Yeah, I mean, we're, I think we'll run out of time if we don't start talking about your work since PND. Oh, okay. And I know you've all talked right. about um, that period being um, the kernel or the starting point of a lifelong interest in activism um, and the work continuing in that vein, although going in a more eco-feminist direction. Um, so I'd love to kind of scroll through some of um, your work since that era and talk a little bit about where you've gone. Yeah, um, I think uh, I would like to try to establish some threads there mm -hmm. between these various bodies of work. Right, because this is quite a dramatic. This is a drawing yeah. um, from 1985, I believe. Seven. Oh, 87, <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, quite jumping <laughs> up there. Um, so if you think about the patterning in the drawings and the paintings, um, and also when you, when you study some of those ancient patterns, there are many references to landscape. And so, for example, uh, some of the Chinese patterns might have been called wave patterns mm -hmm. or mountain patterns. And so I thought, well, um, you know, I'm someone who has, you know, I get bored kind of easily, and um, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just explore landscape as pattern. Mm -hmm. So I began um, working from landscape imagery and trying to uh, represent them in terms of repetition and pattern. So this was black and white mountains, and I think it's mm -hmm. pretty much a direct link to the herring bones, if you think, in the in the drawings and paintings. Yeah, one can um, really see that. And so, um, actually, Clement Greenberg saw this drawing. No, I swear, <laughs> I did this up at uh, the Jurassi uh, Foundation up uh -huh. in uh, outside of San Francisco, yeah. and he was visiting. And he walked through the studio. Wow. <laughs> he didn't say anything, uh -huh. but uh, it was like, wow. <laughs> and doesn't Berg or Berg mean mountain in, uh, in German? In, in the Berg world. means mountain. Can anybody confirm that oh, that's yeah, true? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, of There's course, little, of right. You, do you know that Tom Wolfe uh, derisively called the trio of um, Clement Greenberg, Rosenberg, Rosenberg and, um, and Steinberg, um, Culture Berg. <laughs> it was a big iceberg or mountain that you had to get around. Right? Well, I did a painting of mountains, and actually, um, and I, from here, I was doing these uh, colored sort of uh, painted collages of landscape, and I inserted a, an upside-down Kenneth Nolan uh, hard edge uh, triangle into the mix. <laughs> so uh, I had a lot of fun with those. Yeah. But, um, so from there, um, I started doing these epic scale. I mean, I've always worked yeah. large scale, so mm -hmm. um, that, that was nothing new. But um, I really began weaving together mm -hmm. these thousands of landscape imagery, images. And so we're at, yeah, we're 2008. But from, from the, really, the whole 90s, I was working with this mm -hmm. kind of collage landscape uh, format. And this is um, ap all appropriated advertising imagery. So oh. every single image in this was taken from an ad. And um, I, going back again to the uh, pattern and decoration uh, 
beginnings of all of this. I know when uh, Christopher Knight had written a review of one of these shows, and he, he said it was a National Geographic quilting bee. So, <laughs> but is that wild? <laughs> um, again, it was so interwoven mm -hmm. and actually quilt-like in the uh, juxtaposition of the colored images. So it was not a bad analogy. Uh -huh. And I know you didn't even like if, it. Well, even it if wasn't meant, rise of, Oh, it wasn't, OK. No, it was not. It was uh, the sense of this stuff being made into a tapestry of sorts. Um, and of course, quilts figure very, very prominently of in course. this show. And so I was trying to actually just draw that connection between the, uh, the idea of weaving fabric, uh, connecting uh, images. And um, of course, at this point, we were um, full-on Metro Pictures uh, mm -hmm. fascination with media. Yep. And so um, that interested me as well. Right, so, the appropriate yeah. of mm -hmm. gestures. I'm sorry we can't it's, really it's hard see, to see this. It's too dark. <laughs> but uh, this is an 18-foot, also tapestry-like uh, painting where um, I created almost like the floor of a forest. And it took me 10 months to paint it. but. If you think about the layered brush strokes, mm -hmm. it's very, very similar. It's all leaves. And um, gosh, wow. really apologize for this bad slide. But, uh, and at this point, I was beginning to uh, think about decay. Right. One of my students asked me when I was doing this, he said, is that because you're decaying? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> so interest, <laughs> full-on interest in landscape, mm -hmm. and um, but again, that kind of consistent feels, that yeah. overallness, that right. non-hierarchical um, approach that you see in the pattern painting, mm -hmm. absolutely inform this work. Right, there but is it no is, it's nature no top or imagery. bottom or yeah. yeah there's no right. Mm -hmm. Right way, there's no compositional um, they're focus. They're kind of acompositional. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's a, a, a field in which you sort of are absorbed mm -hmm. exactly in the same way that the. So this yeah. kind of labor intensive, um, overall sort of absorbing the viewer into it mm -hmm. still appealed to me quite a bit. Yeah, so. yeah. Why don't we fast forward to one of the most recent? works yes. and right. since are we running out of time mm -hmm. already? Gosh. There's too much to talk yeah. about. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Whichever one you'd like to if this yeah. is two years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um so you you talked about activism. Yeah. Um you know, child of the sixties here, you know, mm -hmm. never uh, never left. But uh um the landscape I find is, uh, or, or attitudes toward nature um, becoming very, very crucial to my thinking. Uh, in fact, I brought, for anybody who cares, <laughs> an article I wrote um, this past year called uh, Nature Me Too, and it examines, um, here's Caspar David Friedrich's a uh, man on a mountaintop, uh, the sublime and sort of traces are current uh, exploitive attitudes about nature through uh, the, sub the, the use of the sublime and mm -hmm. the, the male gaze. Yeah. So um, the leaves somehow morphed into, uh, I walk every day in my neighborhood and um, I started noticing things beside leaves. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and uh, I started picking up things and bringing them back and um, working, setting them up in the studio and, and creating these large scale um, um, still lifes with. So this is from life? With this, this is a still life. Wow. This is one still life to scale, basically. So. Um, 
and interwoven again in in the uh, painting are leaves and little bits of natural detritus. So um, obviously, what I'm dealing with is hyperconsumption. Um, the now, mind you, this. And I, I don't live in a trashy neighborhood, but this is all picked up within a two-mile radius of my house, right. which is where I wow. make my round. And um, so I really, in you know, my last productive years as an artist, decided that uh, you know the climate change, the environment, um, these are the the issues that I really want to focus on. So. Um, Still a lot of pattern in there. I mean, you can a see ton. the pattern bag over there, the little, uh, on the, that was a shopping bag on mm -hmm. the far right. Um, and um, the sky was a sort of appropriated sky from a Turner painting. Mm -hmm. And um, they're pretty densely packed. I mean, oh, density yeah. is always something that <clears throat> has worked well for me mm -hmm. and I've enjoyed, so. Um, but color and um, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, that, that absorption of the viewer into the painting space. And yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> OK. I'm wondering if we could talk forever, but I'm wondering if we might want to take one or two questions That'd from the great. audience, if there are any. Great. Anybody? us to hear your thoughts on the work. It's actually been a treat. And, and seeing as your work has progressed over time, this might be a wrong reading, but it seems like you started with such subdued colors and um, really forcing the user to, to come in to notice all of the different tones that you're using. Um, but now with this work, it's become so neon and garish <laughs> almost. And you know, I was wondering if that transformation has had to do with all of the ideas that you're talking about, about consumption and, um, you know, just what that image meant for you. Hmm. That is a tough question. <laughs> um, yeah, I've definitely gotten less subtle in my old age. Um, I, I think uh, maybe it's a product of age that uh, you just don't hold back anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in unsubtle times. Um, does, does subtlety work anymore? Um, you know, I was just reading today that, uh, you know, Trump has thrown out all the clean water uh, rule. And so do we want to be subtle? Um, I don't think so. I, I think that uh, the times call for, uh, Something more commanding, more in your face, um, something that uh, grabs people. I mean, the, also as a painter, uh, we're competing with so much now that we weren't before. I mean, in the 70s, when it was a small group and you would be in these shows and you had a small audience, uh, there, there still was quite uh, a lot of attention paid to painting. Nowadays, in order to keep people interested in it, I don't think subtlety is the name of the game. I think, um, uh, and given the uh, urgency of the environmental crisis, I think we need to make that point loud and clear. So if, that, if that's garish, okay. <laughs> I'm down with that. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question or not, but anyway. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Over here. Thank you. Where a number of different professional streams of women have been trying to have their voices heard, 
Do you think the voice of the women artist is being heard more? I didn't hear in the first part of what you said. T today's world in, when... In today's world where there are a number of streams of women whose voices are being heard, and I have to say I do remark about uh, the young Swedish woman whose voice has clearly been heard. But do you think that the voice of women artists is being heard more? Well, definitely more than it was in 1980. Um, you know, the, the main question for any artist is uh, the impact of art on the culture and, um, you know, whether it makes a difference. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg grabs headlines. Um, somebody's latest paintings generally does not. But, uh, you know, I think it's all about all of us acting consciously and uh, doing whatever we can within our own professions to uh, get the message out there and collectively that's going to be heard. But, uh, you know, whether any single woman artist, male artist is going to change the world, I don't think so, but uh, collectively um, I do think it, it makes a difference. I mean, it it's filters down through the culture. And, um, you know, whether it's, uh, it's, it's not as perhaps as powerful as a television show, but, um, you know, it's, uh, the reverberations are always felt through the culture eventually. I mean, I think of, uh, you know, the influence that, uh, uh, women artists had on gender equality and um, racial equality and you know now for me it's uh, environmental equality if you will so it's it's you know sometimes I feel like they're very small gestures but when I think of all artists doing it or attorneys doing it or um, uh, 16 year olds doing it it adds up, so. Well, I think that's our time. Um, I wanna thank you all again for being here. I hope to see you in the galleries over the next months uh, with pleasure, pattern, and decoration in American art. Closes on May 18th, so you have plenty of time to spend with it. And most of all, I wanna thank Constance Mallinson wow. for her time. <laughs> and uh, just Thanks to Rebecca and Anna Katz for an amazing job and an amazing experience and amazing look at history. So thank you to her as well.